Good morning, everybody, and welcome to this second episode of Hawk Blogger Mornings. I am Brian Nemhauser. You can find me on Twitter at Hawk Blogger. And folks, it is a, I don't know, can't quite decide what kind of Tuesday morning it is. Rained a lot last night up here in the PNW. Might get a little bit of uh, clearing this, this, uh, this afternoon. I don't know about you. I'm going to try to get outside if I can. Uh, we got the, we got the spring coming, and uh, it's definitely time to get out there. Uh, good morning to all Pro Seahawks, a new member on YouTube. Really great to have you. Appreciate that. Want to let folks know that folks that are trying to join the membership on YouTube, I think there's something a little haywire with YouTube on iOS on iPhones. My guess is that they're trying to not show the join button because they have to pay Apple a certain percentage if a subscription is is signed up for on that platform. So if you are interested in joining the YouTube membership, which I highly encourage and we'll talk more about, uh, best bet is to go on to a desktop browser, go to the Real Hawk Talk channel, and you will see a button to join. Plain as day, simple, and then from there, on you should have it available to you on your iphone and whatever other device you're on but uh, maybe head to the desktop browser to do that all pro seahawks figured it out welcome happy to have you as a new member i want to say good morning to rps and if i'm pronouncing this one right yoin uh tyrell uh good morning to michael fossick good morning ian cheshire uh, good morning to everybody and and i know based on yesterday it might be afternoon or evening for some folks as everyone around the world seems to tune in and that's great to have. So um, I am, and hello to Corey uh, or Synergy Digital Design. Uh, good morning to you as well. So we've got a fair amount of stuff to cover. The plan for the day uh, or the morning, I should say, was to go deep on defensive tackles. Yesterday went deep on linebackers and I don't know about the rest of you, I learned something. And my general measure for these shows, the only way I'm going to be able to do a show every day is if I'm talking about things that I'm interested in. I can't fake it. I can't just do it based on what other people want to know. I've got to actually be interested. Good news is I'm interested in a lot of things relative to the Seahawks. And for the linebackers yesterday, you know, we got about seven deep in terms of evaluating a couple of players. We looked at a few different sites and their evaluations and kind of talked about uh, where they might fit. There aren't a lot. That was one of the big, you know, things going in is, hey, the Seahawks are in a tough position at linebacker. And I didn't leave that feeling like, oh, man, there's way more linebackers that are fits than I thought. Little tiny bit more interested in Jeremiah Trotter Jr. than I thought. Uh, his tackle uh, closing to the line of scrimmage at 2.2 yards from the line of scrimmage is really impressive and not what I expected for a guy that's as light as he is. But I still have a lot of questions. I wouldn't be super excited about him as a pick. There's a couple other guys that piqued my interest a little bit. I admit I have to do some more research on Marist Lufau, and I still have to figure out how to pronounce his name. But there is enough there from a coverage perspective that I at least want to look into it. From what I saw, the guy's too slow to be a great coverage backer, but who knows? I, I could be wrong. So not a lot of, you know, here's a new guy that I'm excited about. There, as I said yesterday, there's not like a Dorian Williams who I think is, you know, small school, a lot of physical measurables who could be a really promising, you know, rotational prospect. I don't know if I really see that. Today, I want to do similar things with the defensive tackle or interior defender position. And this is a really key, dis um, this is a key position in any defense, but I think it's going to be a more emphasized position under Mike McDonald than it was under Pete Carroll. And so I think it's going to be a key difference. We will see how that goes. And before I get into defensive tackle, which is where I would go immediately, there is some news that broke uh, this morning in a couple places, and I think I should should uh, at least talk about that. People were very interested yesterday in hearing thoughts about the new hip drop tackle ban. I talked about it yesterday. Quite honestly, I'm not that worried about it. I, 
that's just not a rule that I lost a lot of sleep over. It's not a big deal to me. I understand the, the uproar, but just not that big of a deal to me. Now, today, a couple things happened. First, um, new kickoff rule. And by the way, that's Finn behind me. You're going to see and probably hear him at some point. If he uh, gets excited about someone in the jogging by the house, I might have to move him and you guys get to see me walk out of the room for a few minutes. But in any event, for now, he's welcome to join uh, us in the mornings. So new kickoff rule was announced. And I want to go through it with you quickly because I think not only is it a really drastic change to the way the game is played, but I believe it will have some potential impact on the roster and how what kinds of players make the team. So what is it? Um, I'm not going to go through it line by line. Um, and if folks want me to, let me know and I, maybe I'll decide to do it. But the basics of it you are no longer going to have um, kicking teams lining up, you know, near midfield and then running as soon as the ball is kicked as fast as they can down the field with the receiving team trying to block those players at full speed and the kick returner, should they return it, you know, running into those guys at full speed. What is going to what is going to happen now is that the kicker will be, I think, midfield or something like that. I can pull up the exact. Let me let me go ahead and do that just just to make sure. I had this up earlier and I should have kept it up. Um, the uh, the kick kicking team is going to have their coverage unit lined up all at the 40 yard line 45 yard line i believe it is um i don't know it looks like the 40 yard line 40 yard line. yes they will line up at the 40 yard line five yards away at the 35 yard line is where the receiving blockers will be lined up okay so they're only five yards apart why does this matter this is one of the things they're really trying to get out of the game is the concussions, which the numbers all show concussions happen significantly more often on kickoff plays than any other type of play in football. So how do concussions happen by, you know, dramatic force uh, between two players? And how does dramatic force happen? The faster players are running at opposing directions, the more likely they're going to create that and have concussions. So when you have players only five yards apart to start with, you're not going to be able to get the same running start. There's not going to be the same type of collisions. And quite honestly, as someone who talked yesterday about how much I love the ferocity and physical side of the game, I didn't get a lot of entertainment value out of seeing guys run into each other on kickoff and kickoff like blocking or kickoff coverage. I wasn't even watching them half the time. So a lot of these concussions were happening with absolutely no hit entertainment value where it's like, Oh my God, that's a great hit. These were just guys getting hurt for basically no value um, from a, from a fan perspective and really from a game perspective. So now they're going to be closer together. And the other piece here is that the receiving team will have two returners at the five yard line to can return the kick and there's no fair catch. I think they can down the ball, but um, uh, they, the goal is for the kicking team to kick it between in the basically into the red zone, 20 to 20 to goal line. And the idea is I think to get more kicks, kickoff returns back into the game. And while it's not going to be quite as dynamic of a play as the original way kickoffs happened, last year basically kickoffs were pretty much out of the game. Other than teams like Pete Carroll's who seemed to think they had some way of having an advantage to kicking it short, and I, I never got it. I felt like, you know, whatever. Uh, teams were always looking for some way to, to have an advantage. Basically, teams were just taking the ball at the 25-yard line or whatever it was and, and starting with, with that. So now there's going to be more likely to have kick returns. What does that mean? Well, 
it means that there might have been more reason for John Schneider to keep D. Eskridge around than just to prove himself right about that draft pick. Uh, the Seahawks have, don't really have any returners on their roster. And D. Eskridge is a guy that's had some experience and had some success, uh, very minor, but some success there. So that might be a place for him. It also might mean that there's players when they go into the draft that kick return capability becomes more interesting than than it was before because frankly there was basically punt returns and not much else so you could see it have some effect on roster makeup um, going forward um so that's kind of the news on on uh, the the kick rules i'm gonna take a sip here i'm gonna do this a little more often today because Yesterday, there was just all sorts of coughing and, and all sorts of nastiness. This is why, you know, I think the folks on the radio shows take a little bit more of a break and often have someone to talk to. So one sec. Okay, well, uh, that was supposed to mute, but it didn't. I'll get that figured out. Uh, here we go. So the other bit of news that I wanted to bring up was that Mike McDonald's had a conversation with the media today down in Orlando for the uh, owners meeting. And a couple things came out of it. We'll talk about these in kind of order of importance. Um, According to Brady Henderson, uh, maybe my most trusted beat reporter for the Seahawks, he says, Mike McDonald called the offensive line a work in progress and made it clear they're not done at guard. No kidding. <laughs> no kidding. So uh, good to hear, I guess. It's good not to think that they think that uh, McClendon Curtis is their is their guard of choice or, you know, anchor him or whoever that guy was that they signed. I'm, I'm basically choosing to not spend time learning his name because I think he's that relevant. But uh, I think what that indicates that he's talking about it that plainly could be one of two things. One, it could be maybe they're looking to sign Dalton Risner or one of the remaining guards out there. They, don't, they have the least amount of cap space in the entire NFL as it currently stands. You can always create more, but that's what it is. So it's probably a little less likely that they're going to sign a free agent. I think it increases the likelihood that they could go offensive line in the first round. Now, we'll see, but there's a few things here that point to it for me. One is just the situation on the roster. It's dire. Two, it is a position where there are players worthy of drafting in the first round on interior line. And then three, my guess, just a guess, I can imagine Mike McDonald saying, hey, I want my offense to be able to run the ball. I don't believe we are set up to do so. We have not done anything in free agency to improve the offense. There's really the running it back with even less players on offense than they had before in terms of starters. They lost starters and they didn't sign a bunch of new starters. I can see him saying, let's give, let's give Mr. Ryan Grubb first dibs like let's help him the most i'll take care of the defense i i've got what i need there i, I can make do i want to make sure the offensive line so i think there's increasing signs pointing to the seahawks going offensive line with their first pick so we'll see i i still think we got to figure out what's going on there but i think it's worth noting I, i'm paying attention to every little little thing that's coming out of the Seahawks on that front. The second thing, at least I'll mention, is that Mike McDonald said that 
Uh, I'll read you the exact quote around Jamal Adams. Has there been any consideration of bringing Jamal Adams back? That was the question. Mike McDonald says, quote, there has. Hmm. We love Jamal, and if it's the right opportunity, I think we would jump at it. But it hasn't been like this long-form conversation about it. But he's a guy that we respect a ton. And again, if it's the right opportunity for us and the right opportunity for him, I'm sure we'd be interested in doing that. I'll tell you how I read that. Jamal Adams isn't coming back. I think that was a politic answer, Mike McDonald being kind. I mean, it could happen. I guess the 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 strongest evidence I could say to it could potentially happening is they what we did yesterday. The linebacker room is thin. The draft at the position is thin. Is there some situation where they're like, yeah, Jamal Adams can come in here and be a will for us and be a rotational guy? Sure. I think Jamal Adams is going to have to see a lot of things from a lot of other teams indicating that he's not an option for them at a starting position or at a better salary for that to even have a chance. So I don't think Jamal Adams is coming back. Maybe I'll be wrong. We'll find out. But that's my read on that. The other bit of news relative to Mike McDonald is he said that, quote, everything is going well with Abe Lucas's knee recovery, but no timetables. Okay, fine. Um, here is the quote, by the way, about the offensive line. This is one I this just got posted about 15 minutes ago. McDonald said that they're not done adding to the O line by any stretch of the imagination. Quote, uh, quote, by any stretch of the imagination. They've signed George Fant as a swing offensive tackle, offensive tackle, Nick Harris to compete at center. That's some clarity. I, I was pretty sure that's what he was there for, but there was some chance that maybe. Scott Huff says, uh, yeah, I know him really well at UW, and he's a guard. He can be our starting guard. Doesn't sound like that's the case. They signed Tremaine Ancrum Jr. as a backup guard. Now, here's the quote by Mike McDonald. It's a work in progress, and we're not done by any stretch of the imagination. Obviously, there is some great competition going to happen in that room, and we expect some higher-level play this year from those guys, and we're out at work at it. But I think like we're not hitting the panic button or anything like that. We don't play until September. So a lot of time to figure out who the right guys are and who the right opportunities are to make the team the best we can. <laughs> we're not hitting the panic button or anything like that. That translates to we're worried. <laughs> We're not going to tell you we're panicking, but we're also signaling we're worried. We're not happy with this position. So, again, when you've got that kind of angst in an organization about a position that's pretty important now, John Schneider doesn't see, think it's that important, but I think Mike McDonald does. I think Ryan Grubb does. I think uh, Mr. Huff does. I, I just think there's a lot of signs pointing to, and, and even if you throw into the mix, Abe Lucas has no timetable, but it went well with his surgery. A guy that can play tackle or guard sure seems like a likely outcome for the Seahawks early in the draft. So interesting, interesting notes there. Um, now, let's get into, that's kind of a couple news bits of the morning. Before we get into the defensive tackles, the topic of the morning, I want to do two things. One, I want to ask you to give the show a like. It takes two seconds. Just give the show a like. would appreciate that. Two, subscribe to the channel. Uh, you subscribe to the channel and... Uh, You'll get notified if you click the bell when we go live, when we have a new show. 
And I did not set it up this morning, but the intent is that the, the chat is meant for subscribers only. So I will make that change to the future. I forgot to do it this morning, but um, you need to be a subscriber to be in the chat and it's free. So easy thing to do. And then the two other things, uh, go ahead and subscribe at patreon.com slash hawk blogger. We had a ton, I think like 10 to 15 new subscribers yesterday at patreon.com slash hawk blogger. Welcome to all of those folks. Uh, they get instant access to the Slack channel. We have conversations. They can ask questions that the crew answers each Wednesday evening when we do the Real Hawk Talk show. And all of these episodes, every single one of them outside of the Real Hawk Talk one on Wednesdays, the audio versions are only going to be available to Patreon subscribers. So now is a great time to join. Uh, easy to do. Patreon.com slash Hawk Blogger. And finally, I mentioned about the YouTube members. We have a growing group there. Uh, we've had over you know, a dozen people join uh, in the last few days. We're gonna start having more content for them. And by joining on the YouTube side, there's specific YouTube features. So if you're someone who is primarily taking this content or enjoying this on YouTube, I'd recommend joining there because it's gonna let me know if you're a member and I will prioritize responding to your questions and comments. Uh, you'll get a special, uh, I think, indication on your membership. So when you're in the chat or when um, you're just making comments, it's noted. And then there'll be special things like live chat and other things that you'll get access to that others would not. Um, and so it's specific to YouTube. It's YouTube specific functionality. That's why I can't offer it to Patreon members in the same way. Um, but there's very affordable ways to join if you're interested and Patreon members still get everything, uh, every single one of these shows. They're the only ones that get the audio version. So value for Patreon members as well, doing my best to make this valuable for everybody and also to give people different ways to, to join and different ways to have, uh, uh, different ways to have a positive experience with talking Seahawks and talking all this content. All right. Um, now let's get into defensive tackle time for a, a, a big sip before we do this. All right. First thing I want to do talking defensive tackles. I want to talk, I debated whether to start offensive line or defensive tackles with today. And I ended up, you know, I actually literally had started putting together an offensive line show. And then I just want to talk defensive tackles. I like defensive tackles. I like this class. I want to get into it. So in order to do that, I think one of the first things you got to do is look at what Mike McDonald, let's learn a little bit about Mike McDonald on the defensive tackle side. Uh, I want to thank Corey Coleman, who just joined over at Patreon. Welcome to the crew. Glad to have you. Great to see you there. Patreon.com slash HawkBlogger. So if you look at the rosters for Michigan, where Mike McDonald coached, and you look at it for the Ravens, let's start with the Ravens. And this is just for last year. If you look, and this doesn't tell you, height and weight doesn't tell you everything about a player, but it does tell you a little bit. It, it's, a, it's, a, it's an indicator. It's a hint. It's a clue. There were four players on Mike McDonald's roster that were listed as either defensive tackles or nose tackles. And here they are. Michael Pierce as a nose tackle, six feet tall, 355 pounds. Now these are their listed weights, but we all know they're widely off, but they're, you know, they're all widely off by sim probably the same, you know, uh, amount or so. So uh, I think someone weighing 355, Michael Pierce, probably north of that big dude. Travis Jones, defensive tackle, six foot four, 338 pounds. Okay. 355, 338 Justin Matabuike, 
six foot three, 305 pounds. Broderick Washington, six foot two, 315 pounds. Those are the four guys listed there. Now, Brent Urban, I think, also played some inside. He was 6'7", 309 pounds. A couple other things. Now, this is, in de- this is deviating from the defensive tackle for a second, but I think it's worth just calling out. On the outside, their edge players, you had Jadavian Clowney, 6'5", 266. David Ojabo, 6'4", 265. Odafe Owe, 6'5", 257. Tavius Robinson, 6'6", 258. And Kyle Van Noy, 6'3", 250. So what is that? That is a very wide disparity between edge, like end players, and who's playing on in the tackle spot. You're talking about everyone north of 305 on the defensive tackle position. And most of them, average weight is probably 320 plus. And then for the edge guys, you're talking 260. And the average weight's probably in the 250s. You know what you don't notice anywhere? anywhere on that roster on the defensive line whether it's interior or edge there's nobody who's 280 there is nobody who's 290 let's pay attention come back we'll come back to that in a second now you go to michigan you go to michigan and let's just look at the last two years of drafts for michigan 2022 you had aiden hutchinson defensive end right and you know i'm not going to go deep into aiden hutchinson but he is a defensive end and let's well let's just double check his his weight he is six foot seven 268 so he's a little bit on the heavier side he's more like the jadavian clowny size i guess on the edge you had David Ojabo, defensive end. Name sound familiar? Yes, because he was drafted by the Baltimore Ravens, whose coach was Mike McDonald. Then last year in 2023, who did you have? You had Mazzy Smith, get drafted, defensive tackle for the Cowboys. Now, how big is mazzy smith well depending on where you look he is six foot three 337 pounds big big dude who else name should sound familiar mike morris now he was a defensive end he played upwards of 290 into the around 300 he was 300 he tried to skinny down to look like an edge and that didn't work and he has gained weight 300 again so he is more of a defensive end i think here than a defensive tackle but he does play on the inside and he's a larger dude so why am i going through all this because now look at the seahawks roster take a look at the seahawks roster what do we see We just talked about Mike Morris. He's listed on the roster as six foot six, 295. Don't know if he would have been a fit for Mike McDonald here or not, but he he's here. You've got miles Adams who's six foot two, 290. He's listed as a defensive end, a little light for Mike McDonald. You've got Leonard Williams, six foot five, 300. He is listed as a defensive end. Now, whether that what that means, we'll see. But, you know, he can play any of the line spots. Who did they just sign in free agency? Which I think is a better indication of what Mike McDonald's looking for than players that were already on the roster. Jonathan Hankins, six foot three, 325 pounds, and he's probably bigger than that. From there, you've got Cameron Young 
who is not someone they signed. He's a draft pick last year, six foot three. He was playing up, I think, 310, 320. Uh, he started getting up there. So I look at that list. Did I mention Jaron Reed? I don't think I did. Hold on. Jaron Reed. For some reason. Oh, there, there we go. Sorry. Some guys are listed as nose tackles. Uh, nose tackle. Matt Gotell is on the roster. He's six foot one, 341 pounds. Jaron Reed, six foot three, 306 pounds. So you've got a couple guys. There's a guy, Michael Latrell Bumpus, who I think was a practice squad guy. I wouldn't spend a lot of time. He's six foot three, 280. I don't know how that fits anywhere, but um, wouldn't spend a lot of time thinking about that. I am interested. We're not talking defensive ends today or edge players today. I am interested in Draymond Jones because what does Draymond Jones weigh? He is six foot three, 281. Six foot three, 281. There has not been a guy of that size on any of Mike McDonald's rosters that I've seen. He doesn't fit the profile of a three, four edge guy, 260 and below. He does not fit the profile of a defensive end in a three, four, where it looks like Mike McDonald's playing guys that are 300 plus. He definitely doesn't fit the defensive tackle where a 320, 330 plus. What is Draymond Jones? I'm really curious. I would not be surprised if we hear that they've asked Draymond Jones to cut weight. I don't think they're going to ask him to put on weight. I don't think his frame will hold it well. I wouldn't be surprised if we hear that they are going to ask Draymond Jones to cut weight and potentially try to play maybe in the 270s. We'll see. We'll see. I am curious about that. But Draymond Jones, for me, has a huge question mark. And I think knowing his cap hit next year, he just may not be a fit for the way Mike McDonald wants to play defense. All right, so now let's get into players available here. I am a huge fan of this draft from a defensive interior position. I think there's a lot of guys worth talking about. I don't know that we'll have a chance to go into as much detail about each one of them, but there's a few guys that, man, I just, let me do this real quick. I want to do this real quick. Uh, yesterday, and we'll do it again today. We're going to talk about more than just Lance Zerline and the PFF big board. But if you look at linebackers, we talked about yesterday on Lance Zerline's eight point scale. This is kind of a typical scouting scale. What you get is uh, just to give you some idea of how these scorings score. That's a very weird scale. And I don't expect you to remember this. But six and above, 6.0 and above, this means that you're going to be an above average backup player. 6.3 and above means you'll eventually be a plus starter. Okay? So remember those two numbers. 6.0, above average backup. 6.3, eventually a plus starter. Okay? Linebackers. There are three, six, seven guys in the entire draft that are 6.0 and above. Seven. Okay, that is not a lot. Not 6.0 is just above average. Holy moly. Jason Wickland uh, with an incredible super chat. Thank you so much for the donation. Um, that is amazing. And... <laughs> You do not see uh, a five hundred dollar donation that often, and really, really appreciate it. And thank you so much. And that will go to good use. Now I have no excuse for keeping Jeff with subpar audio. We're gonna get him a good mic. Thank you for that, Jason. Really appreciate it. All right. So getting back to it. There are 
seven guys at linebacker that are 6.0 and above. Now, remember, 6.3 and above will eventually be a plus starter. There are two guys that Lance Zerlein has in the entire draft that are 6.3 and above. That is Junior Colson and Peyton Wilson, which we talked we talked about those guys a lot yesterday. Now, you go to defensive tackle. All right, this is going to take me a little while. Three, six, nine, 12. 15 players that are 6.0 and above defensive tackle in the draft 15 double more than double and you go to 6.3 and above there are there's five guys five guys so more again more than double that will eventually be a plus starter and that's what I see when I look at defensive tackle in this draft that's why I wanted to talk about it today because I think there's a lot of really fun prospects and depending on what you're looking for there's there's kind of something for you here we are going to definitely talk about all five that get 6.3 and above from lance zerline we're also going to talk about some of the down the line guys that there's differing opinions on i mean frankly there's differing opinions on a lot of these guys so let's i've probably spent the most time on byron murphy Let's start there. I'm not going to maybe go as deep on Byron Murphy because we've talked about him a lot. He is number one on Lance Zerline's defensive tackle list. He gives him a 6.48. And just to give you some idea, you know, 8.0 is a perfect prospect. 6.0 to 6.39 is will eventually be a plus starter. Um, 6.4 to 6.49 will become a good starter within two years. So that is where he has got, um, that is where he has got Byron Murphy. He's the only guy that he's got over 6.4, I believe. Let me double check that. Don't want to give out misinformation. That is correct. The only guy over 6.4 in this draft is Byron Murphy. So Lance Zerline and I seem to have similar thoughts about some of these guys. Um, his NFL comp for Byron Murphy is Ed Oliver. And I like that comp. I think that's good. People are like, ah, he looks like Aaron Donald, but he's not Aaron Donald. Well, no shit. Like, he's not Aaron Donald. I'm not saying he's Aaron Donald. What do I like? Before I even get into these guys, what, do, what stands out for me about Byron Murphy? I love his athleticism. I think he has the reason pe people bring up Aaron Donald is because Byron Murphy is an excellent athlete at 300 plus pounds. He is his, all the weight is good weight. The movement skills are excellent. The strength, the power is excellent. His Twitch. I look for Twitch is, is like one of the things I really want to see that makes a defensive tackle special because there's not a lot of guys that are six foot, whatever, 300 plus pounds that can really get off and move quickly and jump past, get past a block. I think Byron Murphy has that. So I think that there's a lot of upside there. I don't think that he's had as much production and that's what scares people. And I get it. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. So what Lance Erline says about Byron Murphy, he is a muscular ball of explosiveness. That's my guy. With the tools and talent to become a productive three down defender in the right scheme. I didn't read this first. Twitchy first step quickness. That's what I see. Combined with flexion and power in his lower half, create a recipe for disruption as a gap shooter and as a pass rusher. Murphy is powerful and well-schooled at taking on double teams, but lacks ideal mass and length for that long-term role. He's successful at bypassing protection with sudden hands and quick feet. Um, forget the average physical traits and modest productions and focus on the competitive spirits and disruptive qualities. Murphy is ascending and could become a successful nose tackle. Didn't see that. Or three technique in an even front. I see him as a three tech. He is the guy that I want wreaking havoc on 
the opposing offensive line. I think the combination of Leonard Williams and Byron Murphy immediately becomes really interesting. Even Jaron Reed at nose tackle and Byron Murphy is interesting to me. I just, I think this guy is a high value player with high potential to be a guy you're really happy to have on your roster at a position that is escalating in value. Sorry, I can't help it. I love this guy. He's one of my favorite players in this draft. Now he ran, he was six, he's six feet tall, 297. So he's not quite 300. I think he will play at three plus 300. I think he's gonna be able to put on weight. I'm not worried about that. I just, his body style, I think he's going to be fine. He's going to play strong. He did 28 reps of 225 uh, at, the, at the combine. 487 40 yard dash, 1.69 split, 33 inch vertical jump, 9.3 broad. Okay. Now, I want to pull over to the PFF big board. They agree. Now, remember yesterday, linebackers, there was no agreement practically on these guys. They were way different evaluations. They have Byron Murphy as the ninth ranked player overall on their big board. Top 10 player on the board for them. They have him as nine overall. They have him listed as six foot one, 308. Now, the combine weight is, I think, the more accurate one, but I think that he can play over 300. I don't think that's going to be an issue for him. What do they say about Byron Murphy? I mean, it's just sparkling. Uh, his overall grades, 2021, 73, 2022, 83, 2023, this last year, 91. <laughs> like That's a nice little progression. His pass rush grade, 91.5. His true pass set pass rush grade. What does that mean? They have a different grade for when it is a known pass situation, you know, third down situation where everybody knows it's going to be a pass. And that is, it gives the offensive lineman a chance to know what they're going to be doing and the defensive lineman to know what they're going to be doing. And so they have a special grade for that. He's been really good there, like excellent there, elite there. His pass rush win rate nearly 20 percent 19.6 his run stop rate 9.5 percent so we'll, we'll come back and see where those rank where we talk with other players but i'm a fan i'm a fan and it's a funny thing byron murphy as much as there's good things here he is slipping down a lot of mock drafts whatever those are worth take him or leave him but there's a lot of mock drafts have him in the 20s right now so interesting there with Byron Murphy. I do want to give you another person's perspective. Mr. Griff, see Mike spin move. He published yesterday his draft rankings for different positions. And I, I love Griff. So he does a lot of good stuff. I don't agree with Griff on a lot of things. But I still think he's an excellent guy. He does good work and deserves to have... Uh, people pay attention. Um, and I love airing different perspectives. So I'll have to get Griff on the show here. We'll talk a little bit at one of these points, a little bit more about this. He has Byron Murphy as the second ranked defensive tackle on his list. He has him as a top 20 player. He says he's a three technique that can play two eye or one tech. Um, that's nose tackle. Slightly more stout versus double teams than Johnny Newton, which we'll talk about as well, who we'll talk about as well. Very good pass rusher. Doesn't get to outside shoulder on guards as well. Most pass rush production came against centers. Okay. So that's three different folks and they're how they evaluate all very high on Byron Murphy. I think if you want to hear like why people are questioning Byron Murphy, Production wise, you know, his sack numbers aren't huge. He had eight sacks for his whole career. He had five sacks last year. How does that compare to let's let's look up the maybe the best player to ever play in the NFL. Um, 
at defensive tackle, Aaron Donald. Aaron Donald. Okay. How many sacks? Let's let's take a second and chat. How many sacks do you think Aaron Donald had in his college career? Now keep in mind, Byron Murphy had eight. Eight total. I'm going to take a sip while you think. How many sacks did Aaron Donald have in his career at Pitt? The correct answer is 29 and a half. 29 and a half. He had 11 two different times. 11 two different times in his career. Now let's talk about tackles for loss. Byron Murphy in his career had 15 tackles for loss. Eight and a half last year. That's pretty good, for especially for a defensive tackle. How many tackles for loss do you think Aaron Donald had in his career? Now keep in mind, Byron Murphy had 15 in his three-year career. Now this is a three-year. It's a little bit different, three-year versus four-year but stick with me anyway. Aaron Donald was four years. Aaron Donald had 66 tackles for loss. 66, 28 and a half tackles for loss in his senior season. So when you're talking about production, the numbers are okay for Byron Murphy, but they're not mind boggling. And we'll talk about his partner in crime, Tavondre Sweat, who I'm very high on as well, and how that could have impacted some of that, but, and, and, and the defense that they played and how that could have impacted some of it. But that is where there's hesitation about Byron Murphy is like, yeah, so he looks good, but he just, he just didn't put as much on the stat sheet that you'd want to say, yeah, I'm going to bet my high first round pick on this guy. So that's where there's some controversy around Byron Murphy and why he might slip and why he might be available to you at a time when you wouldn't usually get a chance to draft a player of his quality, in my opinion. Okay. Next, let's take a look at, let's just, let's stick with, Let's stick with Texas. I'm going to talk about Tavondre Sweat because this is a guy who I love. And I love him enough that I think he's a first round player. I have a first round grade for whatever my grades are worth. I have a first round grade on Tavondre Sweat. Almost nobody else does. So realize I'm probably out on a limb here with Tavondre Sweat. But if you want to hear what everyone else is saying, then go somewhere else. I'm going to tell you what I think. Tavondre Sweat is 362 pounds. He's a big, big dude. He is a, he's your nose tackle. You know, that's the position he's going to play. He's not a three tech. I don't think that's where he fits. He is also a guy that has had some question marks about his effort level in past years and his attitude. Apparently a lot of that changed in the last year. Even so, this guy in the playoff game against the Huskies, he would come off the field for stretches because he would tire out. It's hard to keep yourself on the field for multiple downs or series at 362. Some of that effort is some of that fitness. Can any of that change? Do you want it to? Don't know, but that's a concern. I mean, you're probably talking about a two down player. You don't generally spend a first round pick on a two down player. That's the truth. And I I acknowledge that. I think Tavondre Sweat can be a three down player. And here's why I love Tavondre Sweat. When I see him play and move, I see a guy with absolute game wrecking ceiling. He is the type of outlier athlete that thrives in the NFL. They don't all thrive, but I see it in him. He has got the requisite athletic talent 
and size to be the kind of guy on the interior that other teams are having to figure out how the heck do we deal with this guy? He is going to demand double teams. I believe that. I think that's where he's going to be. And I think he's going to beat some of those. Now, one of the things I love that showed up with Tavondre Sweat in the draft, and I'm going to, I'll put this on my screen. I'll share this for folks. If you'd like to look at it yourself. So this guy on Twitter, Nick Patel, his handle is numbers with Nick and I K this came out at the combine. He said, I thought I would put my physics degree to use and estimate the force of all the interior defensive linemen so far. This assumes they hit their top speed at 10 yards. He then says, even though Tavondre sweat was the slowest given his size, he is a menace. Now, what does he mean by that? What he did is he took all the defensive tackles. He took their 40 times, but he took their 10 yard splits because guess what? 40 times do not really matter for 300 plus pound players. Not very often that they are going to be running 40 plus yards on the field, 10 yards. Even that's not often, but that matters. And that's where you really have to play often as a defensive tackle. So he took their 10 yard splits as well. He then calculated their top speed, their acceleration. You put in their weight and their mass and generated what the force was that they created. Tavondre Sweat generated more force than any other defensive tackle prospect at the combine. He generated over a thousand pounds of force in his running. I, his 40 was one of the most memorable and eye-opening performances at the, at the combine. I tweeted about it at the time before I even saw this calculation because this guy is 362 and he was moving. So I really, really like Tavondre Sweat. I think that this number actually is such a great example of why he's a special player. I think he's just going to be a handful in the NFL. I will come back to this list later. I will note since we've already talked about Byron Murphy, he was number three on the amount of force created um, on this list. So to Andre Sweat, let's do a quick look to see where he ranks for Lance Zerline. Lance and I, I, I got to see, I'm going to see if I can get Lance on the show, but he and I have some similar points of view on some guys, not on all guys, but some. Tavondre Sweat is his second ranked defensive tackle. He is, he is a guy that has a 6.38 grade for Lance Zerline. And remember, that's basically will eventually be a plus starter. And what he says is his... NFL comp is Vita Vea and a name that old Seahawks fans, I'm an old Seahawks fan, will remember and probably love. Sam Adams. I love that. That's a great, I think that's a great comp. I think Vita Vea is a better comp. Both of these guys with Northwest ties, so familiar names. Imagine adding Vita Vea or Sam Adams to the Seahawks defensive line. They don't have a player like that. Don't tell me that Hankins is like that. Don't tell me that Jaron Reed is like Cameron Young. None of those guys profile as disruptive nose tackles. This guy, this guy can be that. So that's why I, I just, I love, I really, really love Tavondre Sweat. Would I absolutely freak out and be upset if they'd used a first round pick on him no i wouldn't i'd be one of the only ones to be like i kind of get it but i think he will probably slip to the second round which you don't have a pick in right now so <clears throat> he's going to be a tough guy to get 
This is what Lance Zerline says about him. Sweat is a massive space eater. Hold on one sec. I do not want you guys to have to listen to me clearing my throat. Very annoying. So sweat is a massive space eater. Space, uh, let's try that again. Sweat is a massive space eater whose size and skill have him plugged into a role as a run plugger for odd or even front defenses. He's not quick off the snap or explosive into first contact, but it takes a village to try to uproot him and move him out of the way. The attention he will require from blocking schemes should help unlock the playmaking potential of speedy inside linebackers who won't have to contend with as much traffic climbing to the second level. What did we talk about yesterday? Mike McDonald's linebackers are in the 230 range. He has light, fast-moving linebackers. In order for that to work, you need guys like this to clear the way. He offers more rush than expected for a man his size and could play more snaps than most at his position. Sweat's area of impact will be narrowly focused, but it could create a much larger impact on the defense overall. When I look at the PFF big board, they've got him much farther down. So they do not agree. They've got Tavondre Sweat as the 74th ranked prospect. They've got him. And that's why if you do the PFF mock draft simulator, you can get Tavondre Sweat in the third round sometimes. Like, that's not going to happen. I don't believe Tavondre Sweat's going to be around <laughs> at, at 74, you know, in the third round. What they have for Tavondre Sweat, and we'll just go through quickly here, their grades, 71.8 in 2021, 79.5 2022, 91.7 2023. So again, similar progression to Byron Murphy. Pass rush grade, 85. So they don't have a bad pass rush grade there. His run defense grade, 92, very high. His pass rush win rate, 15.3%. Not exactly the the twenty percent that you're getting from Byron Murphy. His true pass set, pass set, pass rush grade, pass set, pass rush grade, eighty eight point six. So when he knows he's rushing the passer, he's done better. His run stop rate was twelve point eight percent. Now go back to Byron Murphy just as comparison. His run stop rate was nine point five. So. You see, they're different players. They are different players that fill different roles for you on defense. Uh, I should at least share where they, what they say about Tavondre Sweat. I say it's been a long journey. Five years, sixty-two games played. He is a little bit on the older side. He's twenty-three. Um. For Sweat to become an NFL caliber, blah, blah, blah. In 2022, though he had the size to be an impact player, his hand usage, conditioning, and lack of leverage limited his effectiveness. 2023 improved in all areas. He doesn't rely on just being big. His hands are fast and violent. Good understanding of uh, when to throw, which moves and counters. He's light on his feet for a player that size. Sweat has the size you can't teach at best. At his best, he's an impact, versatile, interior defensive player, but weight and conditioning will determine how often that can be in the NFL. And let's look at what Mad, what uh, Griff, I should say, has. He has Tavondre Sweat as a third rounder. He has him as sixth ranked on his list. Uh, he says, if you want a 360 pounder, he's your guy. I don't know. Like I said, I don't often agree with, I don't always agree with Griff, uh, but I do appreciate that he puts time in to come up to these perspectives. So that's Tavondre Sweat. This is a guy that I think is unique in this whole draft. I don't think there's another Tavondre Sweat. Did I say Swift? Tavondre Sweat. I don't think there's another Tavondre Sweat in this draft. If you want a player like him, you're going to have to go get him. And I think you're going to have to get him in the second round. I'm not sure he'll be around. So, and I'm not positive that the Seahawks are going to take a player like him, but I think he could be a total linchpin for Mike McDonald's defense. That's how much I think Devondre Sweat is an interesting player.
Sorry, folks. I am still getting over this cold and it's especially <laughs> rough in the mornings. Um, so fun week to start the show. Let's keep going. Next guy that I want to talk about. Next guy that I want to talk about is Chris Jenkins. Chris Jenkins is a guy that played for Mike McDonald at University of Michigan. I think this guy is, he's got everything you want as his makeup. I mean, this is a good dude. You can just tell in the interviews with him, the energy he comes with. This is kind of the kind of guy you want on your team. And certainly Mike McDonald knows a lot about him. I don't think that he's got the traits to be a first round pick. I'm not sure even that he has the traits to be a elite defensive tackle. I would call him a moderate ceiling player. Like I can maybe see him being a pro bowl player at his best. I'm not even sure about that, but I think he could potentially be that. I don't think he's, I don't think he's got all pro potential. But I also think his floor is very high. I think this guy is very projectable as being a quality starting defensive tackle in the NFL. He is fifth on Lance Zerline's rankings. This guy is six foot three, 300 pounds. So a little bit light. That's part of it for me. He doesn't carry the weight. His frame, I think he's just a little bit smaller. He's got 34 inch arms though. John Schneider's going to love that. He loves his long arm defensive lineman. And did I say, yes, he was 6.3 raked uh, a rating for Zerline, which means he'll eventually be a plus starter. Ran a 491, 40, uh, 1.7, 10 yard split. And uh, Lance Zerline's comparable is Milton Williams. Milton Williams. Zerline, I love it when he comes up with guys that I've never heard of. And I'm not afraid to admit when I don't know who somebody is. I'm looking up Milton Williams. He is he plays for the Eagles. He was drafted in 2021 from Louisiana Tech. He is six foot three, two ninety, and you know he's been a decent player in the NFL, seventy and above grades. More of a run defender than a pass rusher. I, I think Chris Jenkins is a better pass rusher than that, based on what I've seen. So, and again, if you don't already know, he is the uh, son of a four-time Pro Bowl defensive tackle in Chris Jenkins Senior. But Lance Erline, like I just noted, he says he's got a smaller frame for the position, but he plays with good strength and one-on-one -on -one power swaps, can neutralize single blocks, but has trouble fighting back to muddy his gap against double teams, motor stays engaged, frequently running down ball carriers and chasing quarterbacks. But that's what I see. I, like, he's an athlete. He's undersized, but he's a mover. I don't know if that's a good fit for Mike McDonald, honestly. Like, maybe at a defensive end, I think he could be. Like, maybe that's where he fits and could be an interesting thing. I don't know as much about him being a real defensive tackle type guy for Mike McDonald. Flash is more rush talent, pass rush talent than his, than his sack production would indicate, but he still needs to work on developing more go-to moves to pair with his spin counter. He isn't a natural two-gapper. Two-gapper means you are basically playing even on your lineman and you're responsible for either side of that lineman as opposed to one gap where you're basically shooting into one. Um, but he can play upfield and read and react football on the next level as eventual starter capable of creating disruptions. So yeah, I mean, he's, he's just a guy who's gonna be moving constantly and I think has got the bloodlines knows the game well, great guy. So I, I think he's a he's an interesting prospect. I don't think he's a first round option. Interestingly, on the PFF side, he ranks quite a bit higher than Tavondre Sweat. They have him as the 60th on, on the board. I would take Tavondre Sweat over Chris Jenkins every day. And I like Chris Jenkins a lot. Um, they have him, he was a 72 rank uh, grade in 21. 
81 grade in 22, 83 grade in 23. So Murphy and Sweat were both 90 graded guys this last year. You know, Jenkins has been a very solid, solid guy, not, you know, crazy great. His pass rush grade, not great, 70. Run defense grade, 82. His true pass set pass rush grade is 76, so a little bit better. His pass rush win rate, 11%. Remember, Byron Murphy was 20%. His run stop raised 12.6, which was similar to Tavondre Sweat. <clears throat> and if we go over to, to Griff, Griff has Chris Jenkins as his seventh ranked defensive tackle right behind Tavondre Sweat. He sees him as an early third rounder, a little light, but technically sound and versatile versus the run. Decent bull rush. I actually agree with Griff on that one. I think we're, we see that pretty much the same way. Uh, just interesting to see where Jenkins goes. And, and obviously uh, Mike McDonald has a lot of awareness of Chris Jenkins and what he offers. I just wonder if he's a little bit more of a defensive end. And if, if that's something that they're going to value enough to draft highly. So I, I think Chris Jenkins is probably an unlikely candidate for the Seahawks, but one that I like a lot and at least worth talking about. Next guy, we're going we're going all over the place in different order. Let's talk about Braden Fisk. And before I do, let me take a second to ask folks if you haven't already, give the show a like, click subscribe, get access to you know the chats, which this today the chat is open to everybody. Going forward, it's going to be subscribers only. Subscribing is free. Just to be clear, you just click subscribe. You get access to the Slack, not to the Slack channel. Sorry, you get access to the YouTube channel. Um, you'll get notified when new things come out. And you also go to join as a member on YouTube. Now, I've heard that that is not something that is working on iOS devices, on mobile browsers, on the YouTube app even. I think you have to go to a desktop browser and then go to the real hawk talk channel on your desktop browser join there once you've joined and and i know it's confusing but once you've joined there as a member then it'll work on any device but i think they're trying to get around the apple taking a percent of a cut of the uh the revenue so that's probably why they don't have it working on ios if you're on an android device you should be able to just join as a member right there Members are going to get special privileges in terms of answers to questions within chat. You'll show up with a special um, moniker that I will be able to see and answer. If you leave comments on videos in between shows, we'll talk. I'll be able to see those and I'll answer those. We'll have some community questions, things like that. And depending on what level you pick, there's different levels. There is the <clears throat> there is uh, all the way up to the suite level. Um, there's club level. And, and, uh, I think there's Hawk's nest and maybe is the, the entry level I'm trying to remember <laughs> anyway. Uh, but there will be some private Q and a shows done just for sweet level folks. Um, so things like that, that are going to be special values. So join there and then go over to patreoncom slash Hawk blogger. All of the audio versions of this show, everything outside of the Wednesday show that we do with the whole crew. Those will only be available to Patreon members. So patreon.com slash hawkblogger. I immediately post the audio. As soon as the show's over, I will post it to Patreon. So same day, same hour, uh, you'll be able to have audio access, but you have to be a Patreon member. We had a bunch of new folks joined yesterday. Um, had someone new join today. Corey Coleman joined. Would love to see more people join at patreon.com. Slash Hawk Blogger. All right. So we're going to keep going. We're an hour and 10 minutes in, but uh, there's just too much to talk about here. No telling how long we will go today. Braden Fisk. Braden Fisk is a guy that people are all over the place on. He is a combine darling because athletically, I mean, he crushed it at the combine. And let's pull up his numbers there, just so people know. And let's be honest, I will be honest. I don't think Braden Fisk is a fit 
for the Seahawks for a lot of reasons. But we're going to talk about him because he's certainly an interesting athlete. He is number four on Lance Zerline's rankings for defensive tackles. He has a 6.32 grade, so he's one of the five players that he, that Zerline lists as eventually being a plus starter. He weighed in at 292 pounds, six foot four inches. And I want to be clear here. I, I think Fisk is a guy that I've seen in some cases weigh in the 280s. I want to double check this because I've seen this in a few places. Um, one sec. Braden Fisk. Wait. Um, I could have sworn I have seen places where he weighed closer to 280. There's some 292. Um, I know I've seen that in a few places, but I think his weight is a little bit on the lower side. So he's not really pushing 300 and I don't think his frame really will hold 300 that way. He has got alligator arms. 31 inch arms. Uh, this is not something that John Schneider usually puts up with. I, I, we talked about it yesterday on the show. Arm length has significant impact on the amount of leverage you can get, um, as a def defensive lineman. There are some players that overcome it. In fact, there was one last year, uh, I'm spacing on his name, but he went to Tampa Bay and I liked him a lot. Uh, he went in the first round. Um, I got to look him up. Sorry. It's bugging me. Uh, ba -ba 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 -ba. Where was it? Yeah. Kalijah Cansey. Kalijah Cansey. I think Kalijah Cansey had arms under, th <laughs> under 30 inches or something. I mean, it was really short. Uh, so 31 inch arms, not great, but he runs a four, seven, eight, 40 yard dash 1.68 split 33 and a half inch vertical 10 foot broad 26 reps on the bench. Um, and here's what Zerline says defensive tackle with below average mass and length who makes up for it with above average quickness and constantly revving the engine. That's kind of, I, I see him similarly in that he is an effort guy. He's a hustle guy. He's going to be a guy that, you know, is constantly moving and has some speed, but I don't know that I see the physical profile. He's not sudden enough for me to be like a Kalijah Kansi. Kalijah Kansi was cat-like in his quickness. I don't see that level of quickness with, with, uh, Mr. Fisk with Braden Fisk. Um, and I just worry he's going to get overwhelmed size wise a lot and that he's going to get handled because of his arm length. But let's just keep reading. Fisk uses sudden hands and nimble feet to whip single blocks. Once he finds daylight, he flies to whoever has the ball. He doesn't have the anchor to sit down and muddy gaps. So scheme will be important for him. Scheme will be important for him. Fisk is a hustle rusher. Didn't read this first, but again, he's, he's lining with my thoughts who can win quick or late if opponents don't play with proper hand usage and match his energy. He lacks ideal measurables, but has a chance to become an impact defender. He ranks significantly higher than Chris Jenkins and Tavondre Sweat for PFF. They have him as 39th on their big board. So just, you know, it's creeping into first round territory, but like early second. His grades were 76.1 and 21. At 22, he was 86.6, so quite high. And then 2023, he was 73.9. Pass rush grade, 73.7, with not much of a difference with true pass set rush, pass rush grade of 76.4. Run defense grade, 69.4. Pass rush win rate, 8.9%. That's not good. That is not good. Uh, I'm pretty sure Tavondre Sweat had a better pass rush win rate. Let's take a look. 15.3 at 362 pounds. So I don't love that. Uh, run stop rate 9.1. Let's take a look at where Griff has him. Griff has him. Oh, 
<laughs> Griff and I are similar. How about this? All right. Griff has him as a pretty harsh grade. I don't know if I'm this harsh. He has him as the 12th ranked defensive tackle. He has him as a fifth round grade. Yikes. Linearly explosive. First step quick, stiff, poor change of direction. Gets uprooted versus the run often. So I know there are folks in chat that just love Fisk. And I get it. He has got some athletic numbers that really jump out. And getting back to that Nick Patel force generated, you know, number. Fisk was number two behind Tavondre Sweat. Generated 951 pounds of force. So the guy has a has some things going for him for sure i see his weight i see his arm length i see his play style and i just i don't see him in a three four i don't see him in mike mcdonald's defense i just don't think he's a fit so for me it's not a matter of like where he's drafted he's off my board i just don't see him as a fit for the seahawks if they draft him I will be the first person to say, wow, I am learning this. I've really misread Mike McDonald's defense and John Schneider's uh, approach to drafting. I, I just don't think he's an option. So I know there's folks that love Braden Fisk. For me, he's not an option for the Seahawks. Let's keep going. Cause there's a guy that a lot of people love that I am pretty low on relatively i don't think he's a bad player but he's not my guy and this is uh jerzan newton but he prefers johnny newton so we will talk about him as johnny newton in a lot of ways he is kind of like byron murphy like in terms of where they're gonna go how people see him he's like 1a and 1b for a lot of folks they're both 21 and a half years old they're both about six foot one six foot two Murphy has, I think, a little bit more weight to him and I think can carry a little bit more weight. And I think he is, a, for me, he is a better athlete, you know, for what I look for. They're both around 300 pounds, though. But Johnny Newton, let's take a look. And then we're going to do a couple mock draftables. Maybe we'll look at some production, college production. Uh, actually, let's start there with a couple college production things. Let me pull up. Let's pull up Braden Fisk before we totally leave him. You know, he had 19 and a half. Well, he had five years, five year career. So it's a little misleading. Um, 36 tackles for loss. He had nine tackles for loss last year. So, you know, he, he has more production there than a guy like Byron Murphy's had worth calling that out um let's look at uh mr newton so in college four-year career 18 sacks 27 and a half tackles for loss so last year he had seven and a half sacks compare that to murphy who had five sacks Newton had eight and a half tackles for loss. Murphy had eight and a half tackles for loss. Again, they're very comparable in a lot of different ways. Now, if you look at Mr. Newton, he is the third ranked prospect on the defensive tackle list for Lance Zerline. He's got him at 6.36. Again, that means he's eventually going to be a plus starter. And... Again, six. He weighed in at six foot two, three hundred four pounds. He has thirty two and three eighth inch arms. Those aren't long arms, but they're passable. I mean, ideal arm length is like thirty four inches. If you can get that, that's great. Um, his comparable is Javon Hargrave. I think that that that's a reasonable compare. He says he's an active interior defender with potential to build on disruptive production in college. Newton's size and length don't stand out. But he has shown consistent ability to gain extension and set edges against bigger opponents. Newton is clever in setting up blockers and then beating them with sudden hand usage and foot quicknesses as both a run defender and a pass rusher. He's strong enough to hold the point, but he's not going to overwhelm NFL guards with force or power. 
His skill level and athleticism should create additional playmaking opportunities for him as a three down, three tech with early starting potential. So I here's what I what gives me pause about Mr. Newton. When I watch him, I think he he is he is twitchy. So he's a twitchy big guy. But he I don't see the same strength. I don't see the same I'm I'm concerned about his ability to actually beat NFL offensive linemen with strength as well as just quickness. And so Byron Murphy, I think, has all of it. I think he has the potential to bull rush and overwhelm guys with his strength. I think he has the ability to get around guys with his quickness. I'm not sure. I, I'm a little concerned that Johnny Newton could end up being like a Quentin Jefferson type guy that is an effective rotational defensive tackle that you're happy to have on your team for pass rush capabilities, but is just not a pro bowl level player. And I want first round pick defensive tackle to have that kind of ceiling. I'm not sure I see that with Johnny Newton and a lot of other people, a lot of folks, almost everybody else does. So I'm, I'm on an Island on this one, but I'm just telling you that's how I see it. PFF has him right behind Byron Murphy. Remember, Byron Murphy was ninth overall, their top-rated defensive tackle. Johnny Newton is 11th overall, their second-ranked defensive tackle. And they've got him. He had a very low grade of 57 in 2021. He had a 91.5 grade in 2022, and then an 84.9 grade in 2023. Pass rush grade of 84, run defense grade of 77. True pass set, pass rush grade was 75. First guy we've seen who had a worse pass rush grade when the teams knew that it was a passing situation. That's of concern for me. Uh, pass rush win rate, 15.4. So, you know, not bad. Pretty good. Similar to, to, to Vondre Sweat. Run stop rate of 7.4%. Uh he was the Big Ten Defense Player of the Year. Makes up for his lack of size with quickness. Yeah, you know, I, I just, I'm not, I'm sorry. I'm just not a huge fan. But um, he likes to win by getting his hands on a blocker and using a push, pull, or arm over. Brings a wide variety of pass rush moves and counters. In run defense, he shoots his hands up and throws alignment um, after getting him off balance. If he does not immediately win, he can get controlled at his lower weight. That's, I mean, that's the thing. Some people see all the things he can do. I see this risk with him that I just don't see as much with Byron Murphy. I think Byron Murphy's got the tools to, to, to do other things. He is Griff's number one ranked defensive tackle. He has him as a top 20 player. He says he's a three tech that can play big five tech. Um, pass rusher aficionado, very good against run one gap or two gap. Okay. So that's a guy that a lot of people like some people really have him, um, high on their list for me. He's just not as high, not as high, but you know, I admit this is one of those ones that I could end up looking very foolish. We'll find out. All right, let's do a few more. You guys good for a few more? We've got enough folks watching. We'll, we'll keep going here. A few more folks that I think are worth talking about. Folks that we want. Actually, let's do a, let's do some mock draftable before I, I switch over. We're going to do some mock draftable. Um, if people don't remember mock draftable, um, it is where we see a spider chart of different players. I will share my screen so you guys can see what I am seeing. And first guy we'll look at is Byron Murphy. So his height is the second percentile. Not great. He's a short dude. I think that can work to his advantage and can get some leverage from that. Weight, 28th percentile. Also not great. Shorter arms. 
Let's see that. I don't remember that with with Mr. Murphy. What was his arm length? 32 and 3 eighth inch. That's not so bad. Um, so not the, the longest, but 10 yard split, 83 percentile, 40 yard dash, 91st percentile, 88th and vertical jump, broad jump, 57th. So above average in, in bench, his comparables, a defensive tackle, <laughs> Robert Kim DJ. Well, that didn't work out. Grady Jarrett. Interesting name to see there. Um, let's look at next guy we talked about, which was Tavondre Sweat. Let's see where he shows up here. Um, obviously big in the height and the weight, <laughs> 99th percentile of those uh, type of people that show similar athletic. Grover Stewart, frequent, uh, recent name worth knowing about. Phil Taylor. Another one, John Jenkins, uh, all guys uh, in his range. Let's look at Mr. Fisk. Mr. Fisk, Geno Atkins. That's an interesting comparable. Yeah, I can, I can see that. Um, that kind of undersized mover. By the way, I think Geno Atkins for me is the optimistic view. That's the comparable for me on Johnny Newton. I think Johnny Newton can be uh can be that kind of player potentially there we go um he doesn't have uh, mr newton doesn't have as many measurables so a little bit harder to look at his comparables probably less meaningful and then let's look at chris jenkins so chris jenkins Interesting. He, one of the guys we're going to talk about, Ruka Roro, um, very similar um, athletic profile. Lamar Houston, that's interesting. Um, Brandon Dorless, who we also may have time to talk about, and another one that's on that list. So those are some guys just uh, looking at mock draftable, some of the, the different athletic profiles. And let's go back to talking about the defensive tackles. So... I am going to go next. And by the way, I should I should look at chat here. If there's anyone that people are dying for me to talk about. I, I kind of want to go farther down the board. I want to talk about some guys that don't get talked about as much. Uh, we might have to. We're going to have to do a part two. <laughs> we're just going to have to do a part two because I'm not going to get a chance probably to talk about Mason Smith today. I'm interested in. I think it's probably worth talking about Leonard Taylor. I'm not as big of a fan of his. Uh, I think there's a few guys. We probably won't even get to Michael Hall today. So well, maybe we will. Maybe we will. We'll, 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 well, here's what we're going to do. We're going to talk about Ruka Roro. We're going to talk about Michael Hall. And then we're going to call it a day. Okay? That's that's what we're going to do. And then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have more more defensive tackle shows for sure. Cause I, I want to go deeper on this position. If for what we talked about at the beginning is true that they're going to go offensive line early, that just makes the depth and defensive tackle even more important. And we got to get even deeper to find out who some of these guys are that are options. So, and thank you to MN 10 N M. Uh, who says he loves the episode. I'm glad. Uh, I know there's some folks, there's some haters out there and I try to ignore them. I'm just going to continue having fun talking about talking about this because honestly, I'm super obsessed. That's just why I do this stuff. And I'm, I'm curious. I'm also pretty excited about what this could mean for the Seahawks roster. So next guy, let's, let's do Mr. Aroro. First of all, great name. And he's a guy that I didn't know as much about. I've been learning more about. Um, he is rated by Lance Zerline as his sixth ranked defensive tackle. All right. We've already done his top five. This is his sixth ranked defensive tackle. He gives him a 6.25 grades. 
meaning he thinks he will eventually be an average starter. So not a plus starter, but an average starter. So not as, as high on him. He's six foot four, 294 pounds. So again, a little bit lighter, 34 inch arms. That's what you want to see. Uh, those are the type of arms that John Schneider loves. 4.89, 40 yard dash, 1.67, 10 yard split. That's excellent. A little bit lower on the vertical jump, nine, uh, 32 inches and a roughly 10 foot broad jump. He bench pressed uh, 29 reps of 225, all good. But who is Lance Zerline's comparable to Rook Aroaro? It is Justin Matabuike. Interesting, all right? What he says is Aroro had to wait his turn and share reps during his time at Clemson. Thanks to the Tigers deep and talented defensive fronts. His game is built upon leverage and explosiveness, but in 2023, he added a little more polish. Aroro can get distracted by individual battles and needs to keep his focus trained on pursuing the ball and making positive plays. His foot quickness and sudden hands shine in the running game. And as a pass rusher, when he has space to work. So teams will be wise to keep that in mind when it comes to his alignments. The pass rush still needs improvement, but he projects as an ascending talent and future starter in odd or even fronts. So in a lot of ways, I see him as a cheaper version of Johnny Newton. I think this is a guy that you could get definitely in the second round, maybe in the third round, kind of see how it plays out. But I don't think he looks like this guy that is clearly going to be a starter. I think he could be a very advantageous rotational defensive tackle and a guy that you can develop. I think his frame can add more weight. I think he could be a much different player in two years than he is right now Johnny Newton who I think is a good player I just don't want to spend a 16th overall pick on him I don't want to spend a 24th overall pick or whatever it ends up being in the first round if we were talking about Johnny Newton in the second round that's different although still for me I don't see the fit as much um I think that Ruka Roro He's raw enough and his body type, I think can put on a lot more weight where I just think there's something there where he could be an interesting fit for the Seahawks a little bit later. PFF has him ranked as the fourth best defensive tackle ahead of Chris Jenkins. Chris Jenkins was the 60th ranked on their board. Ruka Roro is 54th. Okay. What they have to say about Roro is, uh, well, first his grades, he was 66.9 in 2021. He was 78 in 2022. He was 76 in 2023. These aren't great grades. They're like fine. Like this is not a guy that's, you know, really flashed. His pass rush grade, 67, not great. His true pass set rush, pass rush grade is 71. So he improved again at this point, the only guy that has moved down from when the, the teams know that they're going to the it's a passing situation has been Johnny Newton run defense grade 78.6. So better there pass rush win rate only 8.7%. Not great. It's like Braden Fisk territory run stop rate 7.0. So his numbers aren't aren't fantastic there. Where they see is he's a versatile defensive lineman who can be a high floor player at defensive end or defensive tackle. However, he needs to develop technical pass rush moves to be more than a rotational player at the next level. Um, he's versatile. He can play anywhere from zero tech to five tech. Uh, fundamentally sound run defender. Um, I, the things that I see with him are just a raw player. So that's why I, I, I'm a little bit. I'm not sure I see him as a second rounder. I see him more as a third rounder. I don't think I'd be comfortable taking him in the second round, but if you're talking about in the third round and depending how you've spent your other draft picks, I think he becomes interesting. Let's talk about where Griff has him. Griff, interestingly, we see him pretty similarly. He has him as the eighth ranked defensive tackle, third round 
grade explosive raw three technique with play strength. That sounds about right to me. So I, I think he's a guy that could be could be in in the cards for the Seahawks, but not early. Not early. Okay. Um, out of curiosity, where does he rank on the force? He ranks three, six, eighth. Eighth on the force list. Uh, this is the, the physics list um, that we talked about earlier. All right. Now let's talk about one more guy. Actually, no, no let's talk about one more guy. We are going to talk about Michael Hall. Michael Hall Jr. I like Michael Hall Jr. I like him a lot. He's a guy that's rising for me quite a bit. The more I see of him, the more I like about him. He is uh, six. He is the ninth ranked defensive tackle on Lance Zerline's list. So he he's got some guys above him that I don't. I'd have him definitely above Aroaro. If the two of them were available, I would take Michael Hall. I might even take Michael Hall over Chris Jenkins, to be totally honest. But let's take a deeper look here for our final prospects focus of the day. Um, one thing that's worth knowing with Michael Hall is he is only 20 years old. He's coming out as after a sophomore year. He's going to be 21 probably this year, at some point this year. So young guy, he's six foot three, two ninety. So size wise, again, he's a little undersized, but he could be like a defensive end. I think he's a three tech. Like that's what I see. I think he's he is a developmental three tech with a lot to offer. He has three hundred. Sorry, he has thirty three and a half inch arms. And Zerline does not have a comparable for him. But his, his description is there might be a different conversation if Hall was a little bigger. That's an issue. But a lack of size is hard to overcome on the NFL level. Hall plays with good pound-for-pound -pound strength and hand and stands up to bigger players in front of him. He's twitchy to knock blockers off balance, but will also be engulfed by size at times. He rushes with sudden feet and active hands to whip guards and quick wins, but appears to lack the lower body drive to capitalize on early advantages against stronger competition. Hall needs to add mass, but should compete for a backup role early on and has immediate sub rush potential as a three tech in a one gapping scheme. Uh, also mentions he was dominant at the senior bowl at times. And if you look at Jim Nagy's timeline, you will see video of Michael Hall exploding off the line and giving guys like uh, what is his name? Jackson Powers Johnson. Is that right? Yes. Jackson Powers Johnson. Rocking him back on his heels. He has got speed to power. That's a scout thing, but it's the thing where he can create, even though he's undersized, he can create more force with his athleticism than a lot of other guys that are bigger than him because of how explosive he is. So I really like his, his overall makeup. I want to do something else here real quick. I haven't done this yet. Um, I'm just doing a quick check on this. Where da, 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 da. Hmm. So let me, let me find, let me find Raz scores here. Um, if you haven't followed math bomb, M A T H B O M B, I would suggest doing that. Um, he does Raz scores. Let's see if, does it have it searchable up there? Do I have to be a member? Um, oh, look at that. Love it. Okay. Defensive tackle. I did not know this. So if you go to ras.football. He's got all the scores up there and you can do it by different ranks. Um, and let's just look at Michael Hall.
Michael Hall. Michael Hall Jr.'s Raz score. Um, he didn't do the 40 yard, so he didn't do enough to really get a full Raz score. That's why it's not as useful. Oh my gosh, so much, so many ads. Let me add these ads, please. Um, yikes. Okay. Um, sorry, folks. I'm <laughs> I'm exploring this in real time. It's not the best for you guys to be probably listening to this, but I'm really curious. I want to get back to Michael Hall on this. So, uh, come on, defensive tackle. All right, Michael Hall Jr. So he has a, a 9.27 RAS score, which is good. Um, I'm curious, let's see, 2024. Uh, I have not been doing these for other positions. So I might start doing this a little bit more. Uh, the highest Raz score of any defensive tackle is Ruka Roro, 9.92. And let me see if I can click this without causing absolute chaos. Like, let me just talk about a couple of other guys. Braden Fisk is second with 9.89 of the other guys we talked about. Michael Hall is actually highest after those guys at 9.27. Um, Byron Murphy is a little bit lower down at 8.97. So he's a little bit lower. Chris Jenkins, 8.94. Um, we have not talked about Darius Robinson. That's another guy we'll talk about at some point. I don't know if I really see him as a defense tackle in the same way. Brandon Dorless and I think Darius Robinson are similar in that they are both ends. Uh, sorry. I just wanted to take a look at Raz scores. Um, because I think of Michael Hall, part of the reason I got on this little tangent tangent is I just see him as a really interesting athlete. Um, ah, and Julian Langdon, thank you. I, I had not seen the pro day numbers. This is probably where the RAS score stuff's coming from. He weighed almost 300 pounds at his pro day and he ran a four, seven, eight. I'm telling you, I think this guy is a special athlete. I really like the way he moves. He is twitchy. He, he might be twitchier than Byron Murphy. And I, I really like Byron Murphy's movement. But Michael Hall is a guy that I think is he he is someone I would be OK in a second round pick, depending on where he went in the first round. I think he's got really high potential, uh, high ceiling. His grades, just to quickly go on PFF, 60.4 in 2021, 80.3 in 2022, 77.2 in 2023, pass rush grade of 85, true pass set pass rush grade, 88. So again, he goes up and he's getting into elite territory there. Run defense grade, not as good. 69.5. Pass rush win rate, 18.3. Remember, Byron Murphy was up there at like 19%, 20%. Um, so that's really good. That's a really good pass rush win rate. Pass rush win rate. Run stop rate, 7.3. Uh, what they say is Hall's measurements make him a tough player to slot into a specific scheme due to how quickly he can win with finesse on the interior. His best spot in the league is likely as a defensive tackle, defensive end, and a versatile 4-3 front. His pass rush abilities give him a chance to be a productive pass rush specialist. Um, they say at six foot two, Hall is not long enough to be a 3-4 defensive end. Um these are based off some old numbers, though, in terms of they're talking about him as 280 pounds. His pro day being at at 300 pounds is a big deal. So uh, we got a nice uh, chat here, a super chat from one of our members as well, uh, Eric Kinneman, who thank you for joining and being a member. It's a great day when you have a cup of coffee and enjoy Real Hawk Talk. Thank you, Brian. Well, thank you, Eric. And good reminder to join the YouTube channel. Um, you can join as a member. If you haven't already subscribed, you should. Uh, absolutely worth doing. Click like, please. I think I'm supposed to say smash that like button. Although, you know, that's what my, all my uh, all the shows that my kids watch say that. Uh, so click the like button. 
click the bell to get notified when we go live. Go over to patreon.com slash hawkblogger. We've had one person join, uh, I believe, during the show. Would love to get some more folks joining on patreon.com. As soon as I'm done recording this episode, I'm going to post the audio to patreon.com slash hawkblogger. Only patrons will have access to the audio immediately after every day. And you also get immediate access to the Slack channel. The Slack channel is awesome. Conversation there is nonstop. Lots of great breakdowns going on. I think it's way better than Twitter. So there's hundreds of folks in there. All you got to do is join at patreon.com slash hawkblogger. You won't regret it, I promise. And we are adding more content all the time to make that worthwhile. So thank you, for Eric, for giving me that opportunity to, to, to pitch that. So we've talked about guys today. There's a bunch of guys we have not talked about. And guess what we got? That's why I'm doing these every day. There's just too much to talk about. But we've talked about Byron Murphy. We talked about Johnny Newton. We talked about Braden Fisk. We talked about Ruka Roro. We talked about Chris Jenkins. We talked about Devondre Sweat. And we talked about Michael Hall. Okay. There's other guys to talk about here. We haven't gotten into the Christian Boyds of the world. We haven't gotten into the Mecky Wingos of the world. McKinley Jackson's a guy I know people are interested in. Leonard Taylor, who I don't like at all, but some people really do. Um, there's a lot of guys left to talk about here. Miles Murphy is high on some people's boards. So I think what I kind of walk away with today, nothing changed in terms of the top of my board for defensive tackle. Byron Murphy is a guy I am very excited about. I think I am like Lance Zerline in that my second ranked defensive tackle for the Seahawks is Tavondre Sweat. It's not Johnny Newton. And that's where I'm different. I am different than other folks. I think Tavondre Sweat can be a linchpin part of this defense for years to come and do things that no other player in this draft can do. And that very few players come along that can do it. It's hard to find 360 plus pound players that can generate that kind of force that can move with that kind of speed. I think he's a very unique player. I also think that he's a guy you could get in the second round potentially, but you'd have to have a second round pick. My third ranked defensive tackle on my list is again, different than most people. It's probably Michael Hall Jr. I don't think he's a first round guy. I don't think you'd spend a first round pick. I think he is a second round guy. I think Chris Jenkins is a guy I like a lot, but I'm just not sure if his, if his weight is going to be sufficient. I would take Chris Jenkins probably after Michael Hall in my list. I do think that I'm a little bit more of like a third round grade on Chris Jenkins, and he's probably going to go in the second round. I think Ruka Roro is after Chris Jenkins for me. I think that he is he's third, fourth round kind of grade for me. Um, and I think has a lot of opportunity to, to gain. Um, Johnny Newton, you know, he's the reason I'm kind of got him lower is I just, I don't, I have concerns that he's going to be drafted too high for what he can give. And I also just have some concerns about what his ceiling is. I think that he is certainly someone I'd be comfortable taking in the second round, but I'd frankly rather have Michael Hall and that might make me crazy, but I just like what Hall at 20 years old, who's already putting on weight 300 pounds and running four eight sevens. I just think the upside for Hall to me is more interesting. I think Newton might be more of a an effort guy, and I think Hall might be more of an athlete guy. So that's just my read. I know that's crazy for some folks. Braden Fisk is off my board. I just don't think he's a fit for what the Seahawks are doing. Great athlete, but I don't think he's a fit. Folks. Thank you for joining. That was nearly two hours this morning uh, of the show. Uh, we are already scheduled for tomorrow morning and Thursday morning. Tomorrow morning, going to have Mitch Levy, formerly from Mitch in the Morning, 
uh, on the show. He's going to join us. We'll talk a little bit of Seahawks. We'll talk a little bit of Mariners. So I know some folks are like, only talk Seahawks. And I get it because I've turned into sports radio and I'm like, will you just talk about the Seahawks? But I got to talk about the things I'm interested in. That's how this show is going to work. I will also pay attention to feedback, but we'll talk a little Mariners. It's opening day Thursday. And Thursday, we are going to have Jason Churchill um, uh, join the show, a prospect insider. He's going to ask me Seahawks questions. He's a Seahawks fan, and he looks to me for answers. I am also a Mariners fan, and I'm going to ask him a bunch of questions because opening day is Thursday, and we're going to have to talk some Mariners baseball. And then, likely Friday, we will get back to um, talking about these prospects. Probably won't continue on defensive tackle. I'll probably come back around on these positions. Most likely, the next position group I'll go into is offensive line, and, and specifically interior line. Uh, most likely, it'll come up on Friday. I hope you guys are enjoying the show. I'm enjoying starting my day this way, and I really... Uh, uh, going to see how this feels doing daily shows for the next 30 plus days as we get ready for the NFL draft. Again, please click the like button, click the subscribe button, join as a member on YouTube and go to patreon.com slash Hawk blogger, sign up right now, get instant access to the Slack channel. And just in a few moments, you will get access to this show and audio version, all of these versions of the show will only be available on patreon.com slash hawkblogger. Until tomorrow, folks, have a wonderful rest of your day and uh, go Hawks.